Um, it's my distinct pleasure to uh, be able to welcome Abai Pasukafi uh, here uh, as a colloquium speaker. Uh, so Abai is currently at Columbia. Um, he did his PhD with Dan Ralph at Cornell uh, and then moved uh, on to Ali Asani's lab uh, where he learned all sorts of neat STM tricks and uh, how to build and all, all of that, um, and uh, has worked on a number of different interesting scientific questions, uh, ranging from the quantum world super small to high temperature super conductivity, um, and more recently has, uh, like everyone seems to at Columbia, embraced the world of 2D materials, and he'll tell us uh, a little bit about some of the new developments. Cool. Okay, thank you. Okay, so I'm supposed to turn this on somehow. Good. Can you hear me in the back? Okay, very good. So thank you, Ben. Thank you for having me here. Thank you all for coming. Uh, as Ben said, I'm Abhay Pasupati uh, from New York, which till this morning I thought had the worst drivers in the world, but now I'm convinced that the worst drivers in the world are actually in the Bay Area. That's another story, though. Okay, so this... Uh, Talk is really work in my lab from sort of the past two years. So normally I would say it's somewhat uh, unsuitable for a colloquium because for a colloquium the hope is that I'm going to tell you something grand and wonderful that they've all figured out and they're all sort of bow on it. But this is a topic that's very much in sort of development. But that being said, it's something that I'm sort of incredibly excited by. So so so. Uh, think of this more as a seminar than a colloquium, so please feel free uh, to jump in and ask me questions anytime during the talk, as well as that. Okay. So, um, now a good fraction of my group is working on this particular topic. Uh, the guy who first really started this was Alex Kirelsky. Uh, now many other people are doing this, and I'll say, I'll flash up a slide at the end. We can do this because at Columbia we have a whole mafia of people who are involved in various stages of, of, these, of these materials. And I'll give credit to them in my last slide. Okay, very good. So I am teaching the graduate solid state physics class. And uh, if you're like me, when I first encountered solid state physics, I thought, what the hell is this stuff? And then over time, you come to really love it uh, because you say how beautiful and, and rich this thing is. Uh, but in my solid state physics class, I try to give people some, some context to what solid state physics is. So here is, here is my attempt. So back in, in a long time ago, a, people did very reasonable things, which is they took, say, for example, a piece of copper or an atomic vapor, and perhaps they just learned about quantum mechanics, and they figured out how this, this crazy new theory could possibly work to explain, say, the properties of copper, or copper is a good conductor. Right? And I think one of the things that came out of this is to say, well, we cannot really understand the, the properties of copper, starting from sort of first principles of what we know about the constituents uh, of matter, but instead we could understand various properties of copper by making simple model Hamiltonians, so this is the Condo Hamiltonian, and by studying these uh, simple models, we can get some insight into why uh, this material behaves in a particular way, for example. Right? And we know that this is, this is wrong at some fundamental level, but it still gives us the insight that we want to do. Right? And this was a very reasonable way of doing things. And uh, somewhere along the way, uh, life changed. And uh, I call this now the theorist revenge, where us experimentalists are put to work by the theorists and now we go about satisfying the whims and desires of solving various models. So for example, here's a, here's a Hubbard model, which is very easy to write down, but very difficult to understand what the properties of this model are. And uh, we spend a lot of time actually making quantum systems that in some way can possibly uh, simulate uh, this sort of system. Uh, here's a more recent example. This is, this is a topological insulator. And uh, theorists basically predicted a whole bunch of materials which could have these kinds of interesting properties. And uh, experimentalists sort of go about and try to, try to uh, verify this. 
And uh, I think this started quite a long time ago, but this is sort of still one of the guiding forces of, of things that, that, that happen in condensed matter physics. Um, of particular interest are uh, systems which we call narrow band systems, which simply is, is explained in the following way. If I take a solid, uh, and I assume that the solid is made up of a bunch of atoms, and these atoms can talk to each other, so electrons can hop from one, one uh, atom to the other, then if you put a chain of these atoms together, then you know from elementary quantum mechanics that this chain of initially degenerate states is going to form a band, and there's going to be a certain width to this band, and this width denotes what the kinetic energy spread of an electron in this band is. And uh, what you want to compare this quantity with is how much energy cost it takes to put two electrons on one atom. That's, that's, a, that's a Coulomb integral. And many of the interesting phases of matter would arise in systems where the, the, the Coulomb integral is a large value uh, relative to the bandwidth of the electrons. So where potential energy is important relative to kinetic energy is where one hopes to see new and interesting uh, states of matter. Okay, so let's say um, you want to realize new systems which have new interesting physical properties that your theorist your your friends have predicted. What are your options for doing this? Well, one option is you could make new materials so if you make a new arrangement of atoms, this arrangement of atoms would have a certain crystal structure. This crystal structure would give rise to a particular electronic structure. And by making new materials, you can make new uh, electronic structures and hopefully realize new physics. And this, of course, has been going on from even before uh, people had these ideas for models and so on. This is just material science. So that's Mick Jagger right there, who's a little older than your grandfather. And uh, very good. So that's one particular option. Um, another option one could uh, take up is to create materials that one couldn't do uh, by crystal synthesis, by growing a real bulk crystal. So here I, I give you a famous example. This is from the group of Harold Wong right here. Um, this is growing a material layer by layer by using a technique called molecular beam epitaxy. Uh, you can grow one layer, another layer, and then you can change the material, and you can grow these new kinds of materials that one couldn't possibly have uh, uh, just uh, naturally. Okay, so that's, that's yet one other way. Now this technique, as wonderful as it is, is limited by what will grow on top of what. So certain things will not grow on top of other things and, and so on. And, and so this is, this is a whole science in and of, of itself to figure out what materials are compatible with what other materials and what kinds of structures one can create. So here is another technique. Um, we use all the time, we use lithography, we use fabrication to actually fashion materials into interesting structures which can then realize interesting uh, phases of matter. This is again, I picked an example from Stanford. This is from the STM group of Hariman Oran, where you can assemble uh, individual atoms into the shape of graphene or strain graphene or so on and so forth and mimic these kinds of systems by using artificial lithography. This is an extreme example, but there are many examples which I'm sure many of you uh, are familiar with. And uh, here is yet another way one could imagine doing this, is one can shine uh, extremely strong light pulses at a sample. And here is one particular example where the light pulse has some periodicity. And uh, if it has a fixed frequency and you drive the crystal strong enough, then essentially you create copies of the electronic structure which are separated by the frequency of light. Uh, this is some beautiful work from, from New Gerich's group and then now other people are also doing this. So this is yet another way. Uh, in this method you sort of transiently mess with the electronic structure of the material and you hope that in these transient electronic structures you could create sort of <coughs> interesting uh, properties. Okay. So it is sort of in this context that I should place uh, 2D materials, which, is, which are the materials that, that um, I'm going to talk about, things that we are fond of. Um, these materials, Scotch tape material science, uh, is basically taking well-known three-dimensional materials which very easily cleave, 
a perfect example is graphite, and simply using scotch tape to create individual layers of these materials. And uh, this started somewhere between the iPod and the iPhone is when the first of these things was, was actually done. And uh, in the beginning few years, what people were able to explore quite beautifully is what the effect of dimensionality has to the electrons that live in these materials. So for example, if you take graphite, uh, graphite has electrons which at low energy have energy that goes as momentum squared. So those are massive particles, E is P squared over, over N. And uh, if you take exactly one single sheet out of these, and you look at the energy versus momentum, the energy goes linearly with momentum, and those behave like massless particles. So very famous example of graphene. But since then, we've learned how to do exactly the same thing with many, many different types of materials. So you can make single layers of semiconductors, you can make single layers of superconductors, of magnets, of density wave materials, and each of these has, has new and interesting physics when you take them down to the single layer. So that's, that's sort of one, one set of uh, uh, interesting problems. But of course, as experimentalists, we get bored of just doing this, and we want to ask what's next. What can we do that's beyond just taking uh, a piece of material and using scotch tape to make uh, single layers? And uh, this is an, an idea. Oh, my YouTube video does not play there, but I'll tell you about the YouTube video. Uh, this is an idea called putting things on top of other things. And if you search for this on YouTube, there's a Monty Python video that you absolutely have to watch. It's, 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 it's wonderful, especially if you're a scientist. It has lots of interesting insights into refereeing and so on. Um, so this idea was actually an idea that was proposed originally by Jim Horn at Columbia. Uh, and Jim had the idea that, well, why stop with one single layer? Take one layer and put it on top of a different layer and put things on top of other things. So when I first heard of this idea, I thought it was really daft and it was, it was good for nothing. But I'm completely proved wrong. Now this turns out to be a wonderful way to create completely new materials by simply taking one material of one type, putting it on top of another type, and a third type, and so on and so forth. And uh, the person who really made this happen with his hands at the time was Corey Dean, who was a postdoc with Jim Horn and Philip Kim. And uh, Corey Dean now is, is a professor at Columbia. And the two other people who should get a lot of credit for this are these two guys in Japan, Taniguchi and Watanabe, who make single crystal boron nitride, which is a beautiful insulator. And uh, they are probably the most highly scientists that I've, that I've ever seen in my life because their name is on absolutely every paper that's, that's written in this field. Okay, so fine, we, in the first few years, this is between 2010 and, and a couple of years after that, uh, people were happy enough to take one layer and put it on top of another layer, but then of course you get bored with that and you ask what's next, what can I do? That's, that's a little different now, rather than simply putting at random one layer on top of another layer. And one perhaps fairly obvious uh, idea is the following. I can take one layer, and here now I'm looking at actually the lattice structure of one layer, and I can put the second layer on top of it, and I can twist the second layer relative to the first layer. And since these uh, layers are two-dimensional sheets, uh, putting the second layer on top in this fashion actually works. You can actually put them on top of each other, and uh, this second layer will not be extremely unhappy and decide to do other things, which would happen if you try to grow this material. And uh, this thing is called a, a moiré pattern. Moiré pattern referring to the fact that if you look at the lattice periodicity, um, when you do this kind of a twist, you have a larger periodicity in the system, and the larger periodicity is simply given by the difference of the lattice constants. And these kinds of moiré patterns appear everywhere. So that's a moiré pattern, they appear everywhere in art and so on. Now, another degree of freedom which actually has not been exploited a whole lot is instead of twisting, you can also apply strain to one of the layers, make the lattice constant different that way. That's a degree of freedom that hasn't nearly been explored as much. Okay, so now what I want to do is I want to take one particular material, which is the material which really sparked all of the interest in this field, which is the case where each of these materials is a sheet of graphene. And I want to take you a little, through a little bit of the chronology of how this material became interesting. Okay? Very good. 
So let's start with monolayer graphene. And uh, if you do a solid state physics class, you will learn how to do this calculation. You will learn how to calculate the band structure of graphene. Here's what it looks like. So uh, this is energy in the, in the third axis versus two directions of momentum, kx and ky. And if you look at low energy, then the uh, allowed states lie at six points. These are the famous Dirac points. So at low energy, the density of states, the number of available quantum states is extremely small. That's right there. And uh, the interesting point that I want you to focus on is as you increase the energy, you will reach a particular point in the band structure right here where the dispersion goes uh, one way this way and the opposite way that way. So this is a saddle point in the band structure. And a saddle point in the band structure gives rise to a high density of states, the so-called band of singularity. And so this is the overall density of states of monolayer graphene. It has a Van Hove singularity. And uh, the important point is that the distance of this Van Hove singularity from the Dirac point is set by the lattice constant of graphene. And for graphene, this Van Hove singularity is a couple of electron volts, which is an enormously high number for solid state physics, away from this Dirac point. So this Dirac point is, is pretty easy to access an experiment. If I just take a piece of graphene, you're naturally sitting at the Dirac point. But in order to reach this Van Hove singularity, I have to add an enormous number of, of electrons or holes to the system. And this has so far proved impossible. Now, let's first talk about twisted graphene. So this is <coughs> twisted bilayer graphene. This is the Moray pattern. And so one useful way to think about twisted bilayer graphene is to think about the lattice constant of the, the twisted bilayer graphene as having a lattice constant that's much larger than the original lattice constant of graphene. And so what this does, if I look at the density of states, since this distance from here to here is proportional to that lattice constant roughly, um, if I make the lattice much bigger, I make those two things come closer. And so if you follow this logic, then as you make this wavelength or you make this twist angle smaller and smaller, this wavelength of the Moray pattern becomes bigger and bigger. And these two singularities in the density of states start to come closer and closer together. And as you get to extremely small angle, they should more or less come very close to the Fermi level. Yeah. So that sort of understanding was reached way back in 2008, 2009. In fact, here is a beautiful STM experiment from the group of Eva Andre, where they measured uh, the Moray pattern in twisted by the graphene. And they measured these two Van Hove singularities uh, with a spacing of about 10 millivolts. And uh, so this was already realized back then. This is another beautiful experiment from, from Mike Cromie, not too far from here, where he measured these, these peaks, these Van Hove singularities as a function of angle. And he was able to show that as this Moray pattern gets bigger in real space, these two Van Hove singularities start to come closer and closer. And, and this is from, from about 2015. Okay. The really key theoretical insight was provided by, by Alan McDonald. Um, and Alan McDonald realized the following. If I take graphene, and then I convert it to twisted bilayer graphene. Here is the band structure of twisted bilayer graphene of one of the two layers. Um, so, so, so what I have here is I have the original Dirac dispersion of graphene. And because of the, the Moray pattern, I now have created a copy of this dispersion, but with a much smaller energy scale. What Alan McDonald realized is that what one has to carefully take into account is the fact that an electron in one layer and the electron in the other layer can actually hop between the layers, so they can hybridize with each other. And you know how to do that problem. If I have two layers and the electrons can hop between the layers, then for every state here, I'm going to create a bonding and an antibonding state. And this bonding and antibonding state are going to separate from each other. And that's how, that's how two-level systems work. And if you do the calculation properly, then what McDonald predicted is that for a particular angle that he termed the magic angle, this hybridization between the layers would send this level all the way down to the Fermi level. And I'll have this magic state where this entire range of momentum space 
is all degenerate. So all the electrons are sitting at the same energy, that energy would be the formula. That, that's what he called the magic angle. Okay? Now, he also predicted what the value of this magic angle is. He said it was 1.06 degrees. And good luck trying to convince an experimentalist to do that experiment because I have to take one sheet of graphene, I have to find another sheet of graphene, I have to match their lattices to 1.06 degrees, put them on top of each other, and then this thing would happen. And in general, um, I think this was largely unnoticed, with the exception of one very important person, uh, which is Emmanuel Tutuk, who is also at Austin, where, where Alan McDonald is. So probably, if, if I had to guess, I would guess that Alan McDonald badgered his younger colleague into doing something about this. And uh, what uh, Emmanuel, what they did is, is quite fantastic, and I think he doesn't get nearly enough credit for it. Um, and he came up with this very innovative way for doing this, which is the following. Uh, imagine I have a large sheet of graphene. It's possible to stick to exactly one half of the sheet. So this is a large sheet of graphene. It's possible to stick yourself to just one half of the sheet and just exactly rip it out from the other half of the sheet. Well, what have you done then? You don't know the lattice direction of each of these sheets, but what you know is that both of them came from the same sheet. And so both of them are aligned with each other perfectly. And then you can rotate one of the sheets by whatever angle you want, and then you put it on top of each other, and voila, you've created this magic angle graphene, even without knowing what the lattice constants of, of directions of each of them are. Now the problem with this is that you make a sample, and immediately what happens is that this guy rotates back, and, and rotates back to zero degrees from one degree. Because it really doesn't want to be at one degree, it wants to be at zero degrees. And so they tried a whole bunch of samples. This was around 2015 and 2016. They have a few papers even, but they didn't stick with it. He gave up at some point and said, this is too tough for me to do. And, and uh, that was the end of that. And uh, the next uh, real advance in this was in 2018. This is a group of Pablo Rio Herrero at MIT, where basically they stuck with it. They just went and they kept doing this till a sample worked. And when they made a sample at this magic angle that, that Alan McDonald had predicted, voila, this sample turned out to be a superconductor. Right? And people have been searching for superconductivity in graphene for a long, long time, and he made it happen. So, so that really, in my mind, this is what kicked off uh, my interest at least. Till this point, I was not super interested, and then I saw this, and I was like, hey, let's go make some samples. Um, he also saw that, uh, and I'll talk about this a little bit, that in certain parts, when you dope the uh, Moray pattern just right, you also create an insulating state. And that insulating state looked very much like a Mott insulator, something that we know and love in solid state physics. So since then, there's been an absolute explosion of work. Uh, so first, this was, this was sort of confirmed by my colleague, Corey Dean. <coughs> Uh, there's some beautiful work here from David Goldhaber Gordon showing that at certain regimes you can get a magnet from two layers of carbon, neither of which are particularly magnetic. Uh, uh, there's uh, even more recent work, this is from Dimitri Efitov, which everything looks much cleaner than the original devices of, of Pablo. And quite interestingly, this, this insulating phase that Pablo was measuring now seems to have disappeared in, in, in the new measurements. And so this is a, a field that's really rapidly evolving since 2018, which is when sort of the first discovery was, was made public. Okay. So um, let me put down some open questions for what one might like to know uh, in this material particularly, and then I'll try to answer a few of them. So let me also keep a track of time. Okay, good. Um, so let me put down some questions. So one is, is there actually an insulating phase in this material at all? And, and the experimental data so far are, are inconclusive. And if so, is this thing really a Mott insulator? Or is this some other type of insulating phase? Uh, there's always a question when, when you see superconductivity, whether this is mediated by uh, phonons, as in traditional low temperature superconductors, or by some other electronically mediated mechanism. And uh, this phase that, that David originally found, now we can also show, or 
it's been seen that there's, it has topological properties. How do we properly understand this space? That's not really known yet. Uh, at a very, you know, even simpler level, one can ask the question, Alan McDonald gave us a picture of what the electronic structure was. This is based on a very, very simple model, which we ought not to really believe. Is this picture actually correct? One can ask, if I put two electrons on one side of this model lattice, how much does it cost? How much is the interaction energy, a very fundamental parameter? And one can also ask, if I put one electron at one side and I put another electron at a different side, how does the interaction vary with distance? So these are all sort of very, very fundamental and basic questions about uh, the system that are slowly being answered. And I want to tell you a little bit about experiments in my lab where we address some of these things. Okay, so for this part of the talk, the way we do the experiments is using scanning tunneling microscopy, which there are many people here who are quite expert at this. Uh, the idea is you bring a sharp metal tip close to the surface, and uh, if you do this, then you, you can flow electrical current between the tip and the surface by tunneling. And uh, the important aspect of this is that the number of ways that you can tunnel in at a given energy is proportional to how many states you have available. So more states you have available, more current you get. And so the STM is a, is a measurement of what the density of available states at a given energy and a given position is in the sample. And so that's what we are. And, and so here's, here's a picture of my, my poor instrument at Columbia. Okay. So first, so here is a picture of, of twisted bilayer graphene in the STM in, in my lab. Uh, this particular sample is not at the magic angle, so this is at 2.02 degrees, which is slightly larger than the magic angle. And I want to first take you through this before I show you what the magic angle looks like. Um, what you see here is contrast, and this contrast refers to how high the tip is above the sample. And you see that there are regions where the tip is higher, so these, these are buckled upwards, and there are regions where it's depressed, so the tip is, is lower down, uh, closer to the surface. And uh, the reason is the following. In these regions, the honeycomb lattice of the bottom layer is aligned perfectly with the honeycomb lattice of the top layer. That is energetically the most unfavorable orientation for two sheets of graphene. So the two sheets of graphene repel each other and uh, buckle outwards. In uh, the dark regions, one of the honeycomb lattices is exactly at the center of the other honeycomb lattice. This is so-called AB or BA stacking of graphene. That's the energetically preferred orientation for two sheets of graphene. And so here the two lattices sort of stick together. And in between you have other arbitrary stacking orientations. Okay. So we measured a bunch of these things. These are all at different angles. So in every case, we tried to make a sample that was at the magic angle. And roughly one out of 10 samples turns out to be at the magic angle. And this gets old pretty fast for the graduate students. And uh, well, we haven't figured out how to solve this problem. So, but one of the nice things, at least in the beginning, is we did not know the electronic structure of angles that were very close to the magic angle, but not exactly at the magic angle, and so we got all those things for free by failing. But after you've figured this out, then it's not interesting anymore. Okay, so one particular day, uh, I remember I was actually at the, at the, at the Flat Iron Institute, and my student uh, called me and said, boss, I got the magic angle. And so I was very happy, and then I, I I was like, and then he said, boss, it's not the magic angle. And I was like, what do you mean it's not the magic angle? He said, oh, the spectrum doesn't look like what McDonald's said. And, and then I had to explain to him that the spectrum is what the spectrum is, and what McDonald's said might or might not be true, but the spectrum is definitely what the spectrum is. Anyway, so this is the spectrum of magic angle graphene. This is at that predicted uh, uh, angle that, that McDonald told us. And uh, so since then, there have been now several papers which, with the exception of Ivan Ray's work, all the other work basically agrees. The interpretation doesn't always agree, but let's not worry about the interpretation. 
this is what the spectrum of magic echography looks like. And so it doesn't look exactly like what McDonald told us. McDonald told us that these two peaks would merge into a single peak, which would be magnificently flat and sharp. It, it doesn't quite do that. Instead, it, it has two peaks. And these two peaks are split by about 20 millivolts from each other. And uh, we can sort of compare uh, theory and experiment for different angles. So here is different angles in experiment, different angles in theory. And basically, theory agrees very well with experiment until we come pretty close to this uh, magic angle. And when I say theory, this is a theory that has no interactions in it. So this is just single particle theory. So this is to say that even at the level of not including interactions, the electronic structure of this material is not something that, that theorists as of now can get very well. Okay, so after we got this data, we actually went to angles that were even smaller than this, so slightly smaller, and if you measure these two peaks, these two peaks actually come even closer together. And then I had a simple question, McDonald promised us that the magic angle was defined by the angle which these two peaks come and sit on top of each other. And now I'm cheated because if I go down to a smaller angle, I get peaks that are even closer together, but that thing is not a superconductor. So in what way is this sample magic? And here is what I can tell you about that. Um, if you concentrate not on the spacing between these two peaks, but you look at the width of each of these peaks, the width of each of these peaks is actually minimized close to the magic angle. Right? And uh, if you think about what is really important, what is really important is not the spacing between these peaks, but actually the width of each of these peaks. This is the bandwidth. And so the bandwidth is actually minimized at the magic angle or very close to the magic angle. If you consider how much energy it costs to put two electrons on a single Moray site, that energy should keep scaling down as the Moray pattern gets bigger in real space because two electrons get to avoid themselves over a larger uh, size scale. And so if you look at the ratio of these two numbers, the ratio of uh, the bandwidth to the interaction or the interaction to the bandwidth, that ratio, the interaction to the bandwidth is strongest at the magic angle. So that's our definition of the magic angle. Okay, now one of the really beautiful things in this field is the fact that you can simply use a capacitor to add or subtract <coughs> electrons to this sample. Right? So what you do is you take one of these samples and you have close to it an electrostatically coupled uh, electrode. You apply a voltage to this electrode and you bring electrons or holes onto the sample. And so by doing this, you can tune where the chemical potential lies so if I do not apply any gate potential, the chemical potential lies between, exactly between these two peaks. And if I uh, put in a lot of electrons, I can tune the chemical potential in this fashion. If I have a lot of holes, I can do that. And that, to my mind, is really one of the key advantages of, of these kinds of materials as modern quantum systems. Normally, when you want to do this with a three-dimensional material, your only choice really is to change a parameter like doping. And doping always brings with it chemical inhomogeneity and all of these things, so you're really studying different samples, this and this and this are different samples. Here, by just applying this gate voltage, you can study all of these samples in just one experiment. Okay, so now we can ask the question, what happens as you start to dope electrons or holes into the system? And uh, if you go through the math, what you will figure out is in order to completely fill this band, you have to put four electrons or holes onto one of these Moray unit cells. So here's a Moray unit cell. So four electrons corresponds to full filling of one of these things. And uh, what we saw in the experiment is when you go to exactly half filling of this Moray unit cell, so you have two electrons on each of these Moray unit cells, and you measure the spectrum, you measure the, the density of states in that particular case, you see very nicely a gap start to open in the spectrum. 
So what we can confirm is that at this temperature, which is 5 Kelvin, we indeed see a gap or signs of an insulating state uh, appear exactly when you have one half filling of this Mori lattice site. And I should also say that we do not observe any breaking of any translational symmetry, so this does not appear to be a density wave uh, of, of any sort. Uh, it would be consistent with a Mott insulator. Also, the size of this splitting is on the order of 7 millivolts, and that tells you roughly how big the on-site Coulomb interaction has to be. The on-site Coulomb interaction cannot be 100 times this number, and it cannot be smaller than this number. It's probably a couple or a few times this number. We can do a little better than that. <coughs> we can apply uh, doping continuously, and we can shift uh, the chemical potential through directly through the entire band. So this is with no doping, and then as I dope it, this, this band starts to approach the Fermi level, and then it goes through the Fermi level. Something you'll notice very interesting here is that the distance between these two peaks actually changes as you dope it. And why does this happen? So this, a simple reason why this would happen is because of the so-called Fock term, the exchange interaction between an electron on one side and on the neighboring side. And what this allows us to measure carefully is what the nearest neighbor interaction is. And uh, if you fit this, it turns out that the nearest neighbor interaction is also on the order of a few millivolts. So with these measurements, we sort of have a picture of how interactions in this system are. So on site, you have an interaction that's on the order of perhaps 20 millivolts. At the nearest neighbor, the interaction is on the order of 6 millivolts and, and, and so on. So as a whole, this is a system where the bandwidth is on the order of the interaction energy. Okay, so finally, one final interesting experimental observation in this system. I can actually image with the scanning tunneling microscope, I can image what the wave functions look like at every energy. I can just go to an energy, look in real space, and see what these wave functions look like. So here I'm showing you pictures of what these wave functions look like at different energies, that's, that's this axis, and different dopings. And for the most part, what you will see, you will see something that has triangular symmetry. Triangular symmetry is the symmetry of the Moiré pattern itself. And so all of the wave functions also seem to have the same symmetry, which is all well and good. Each of these three dopings is far away from that half-filling point where we saw that gap emerge. Now if I go exactly to that half-filling point and I look at what the wave function symmetries look like, at that half filling point, we see something very interesting. Those wave functions completely break the three-dimensional triangular symmetry of the system. So in other words, it has picked preferentially some direction out of the three possible directions. We would call this a, a, a pneumatic. Interestingly enough, this is for the, the experts in the audience. We have seen exactly the same behavior now in twisted double bilayer graphene, which has slightly different phenomenology from twisted bilayer graphene. Here as well, you can see this clear breaking of the threefold rotational symmetry. So here as well. And let me give you a very simple picture for how one can explain such rotational symmetry breaking. Um, imagine I have a site that's connected to other sites on a triangular lattice. And on every side, I have three orbitals, red, green, and blue. And these three orbitals are initially degenerate. And I have one electron on each of these, these orbitals. Now, um, if I have this situation, it can become preferential for the orbitals to order themselves in energy so that one of the orbitals falls down, the other orbital goes up. I can now fill two electrons into this lower orbital. And by doing this, I can lower the overall energy of the system. Right? And so this would be a case where one of the orbitals is preferentially populated versus the other orbitals, and that will break the rotational symmetry of the wave functions. Now the problem in, in using this kind of description in these graphene systems 
is even the description of this kind of system in terms of orbitals is something that at the level of theory has not yet been worked out. So I think it's something that, that um, will be done in the future. Okay, so for this experiment, the things that we've learned, the bandwidth is, is minimized at the magic angle. It's on the order of 10 millivolts. The ratio of the Coulomb to the hopping is of the order of one. Uh, there's significant interactions at neighboring sites, so it's not really just on-site interactions. And as far as we can tell, there's no translational symmetry breaking at half filling, but there is very definitely rotational symmetry breaking at this half filling point. Okay, so, um, and I should just say that in graphitic systems, there is now a rich phenomenology. So this is an ABC graphene from Feng Wang. This is twisted double bilayer graphene from Philip Kim, where interesting states like this, insulating states, superconducting states, have also been seen. Um, so, so even in terms of graphitic systems, this is sort of a rich area, rich phase space that's, that's being studied. So I want to now jump over to another system, but I will perhaps pause very briefly and take any questions at this point, or we can keep charging on. Yes? Um, are these systems that you measure superconducting? Not as far as we can tell, because we cannot go to low enough temperatures where they are actually superconducting. Is and it because of temperature, or is somehow the capping important? Uh, in our experiment, we are temperature limited. Uh, the person who has actually, I, I've heard rumors, is Ali Azdani, who's, who's gone down to low enough temperature. And I've heard rumors of rumors that there's been some sign of superconducting gaps, but I've not seen any of, any of that. Yes. Yeah. Tony, hi. I, I, when, when you compare with the simple theory, yes. how, how simple is it? Because it, does it take at least vertical relaxations into account? Those, those are obviously in the very simplest theory is you just have the two sheets that don't move. That's, yes. That's clearly pretty far off. Then you can have local lateral relaxation. So. Yes. So, uh, yeah, so we took that into account in, in our single particle theory. There's a fairly well-developed literature for how to do that from Koshino and Kachiras. Uh, but even that at the magic angle doesn't quite capture uh, experiment. It's off in, in reasonably significant ways that it's important. Lateral relaxation could be one effect. We also see a polarization form. I'll, I'll t I can talk to you more about that, which might also play a role. Yeah. Yes. So I've heard that there were concerns for this talk messed up. When you break, you introduce a lot of mini strings locally. Absolutely, yeah. Are there concerns for are there concerns of this strain in your supermedic, for example, the pneumatic? Yes, absolutely. So um, strain is always present, and strain, if you wish, picks one of the three directions. Uh, but if the phenomenon was simply related just to strain alone, we would expect these kinds of symmetry breakings to happen at, at all energies and all dopings. So we see this phenomenon coming only at a specific doping, which is this half filling. And so that gives us some confidence, but you're absolutely right that, that one ought to do some strain dependence of this, for example to learn more about this phenomenon, yes. Okay, very good, so um, let me charge on. So again, as experimentalists, um, we're not satisfied with graphene or graphitic systems, and we might ask, in what other materials is there similar sorts of physics? And uh, Alan McDonald is one smart guy. That's, that's the second take home message of this talk. So Alan McDonald already back, this is more recent work, but already way back in 2011 and 2012, told us that, remember that I told you about how in twisted bilayer graphene you have this flat band that arises. It's because of this special condition where the, the uh, bonding, anti-bonding splitting exactly matches where this position of this point is. That's a special condition, and that you need that special condition because in graphene, the dispersion relation looks like straight lines. What uh, McDonald uh, said is that if you take a material that's a generic semiconductor, so this is the valence band of a semiconductor, and if I apply a periodic potential with a large 
period in real space or small in momentum space, then I can do the same thing. I can create an isolated band which is fairly narrow and all of those things ought to appear in this kind of semiconductor system without the need for any magic angle. And so that set us off. And uh, the system that we choose to work with are these materials, the transition metal dichalcogenides. So these are analogs of graphene where I have two different atoms. One of them is a metal, one of them is a calcogen. So examples are tungsten diselenide, molybdenum diselenide, molybdenum disulfide, and so on. And these materials, I'll, I'll cut this, this story short. You can ask Tony all about them. Uh, the important thing, as far as I'm concerned for, for this talk, is that these are semiconductors, and all of the physics that I'm going to talk about is in the valence band of one of these semiconductors, tungsten diselenide. And so you can throw away everything about the conduction band. And in the valence band of these materials, due to strong spin-orbit coupling, um, for a given point in momentum space, you have only one of the two spins populated, either the up or down spin. And so if you, if you look at what's essential as far as my story, you can throw away everything in the, in the electronic structure other than this is the structure of the valence band. The valence band has two uh, uh, pockets, one of which has a spin up in it and the other one has a spin down in it on, on the opposite side. And now what we're going to do is we're going to play the same game that we did with twisted bilayer graphene. I'm going to take two sheets of these, I'm going to rotate them by a small angle, I'm going to place them on top of each other. And if you ask your theorist what it is that you expect to get in this particular case, uh, this is what you expect to get. This is that flat band. So if you look at this uh, solid curve, that's the valence band of one of the layers. This is the valence band of the other layer. This is the hybridization where the two of them meet. And so that gives rise to this somewhat flat back. And uh, we are going to look and see what happens in this particular material. And so we went ahead and make sam made samples of this. And there's a somewhat interesting materials interlude to this, which is that these materials are typically crappy. Everything other than graphene is crappy. And uh, if you look at one of these materials in the STM, this is what the thing looks like. I cannot tell what are the atoms and what are the defects in this thing. And uh, so here on a local scale, you can see a whole bunch of, let, uh, of defects. And so uh, Jim Hone, and more particularly a postdoc who worked with him, actually grew these crystals. These are old crystals. People have grown them for many years. But he grew them with a nice flux method where we were able to reduce the number of defects from something that looks like this, where 1% of all the sites are defects and reduce the defect concentration by about a factor of 1,000. And it's only when you can do this that you can see all of the physics, beautiful physics that comes out. Um, if you work with these samples, you don't get anything. Okay, so now we've done this, we've made good materials, we've uh, made two layers that are twisted relative to each other and they're twisted by some angle, not any magic angle, they're just twisted and I'm going to measure now electrical transports or the resistance of the sample at low temperature as I fill this valence band. So I've, I've taken this valence band and rotated it, so here's the valence band, and I'm going to fill this valence band slowly, and this tells you what the, the resistance of, this, of these samples is as a function of this doping. And what you see is initially the sample is very resistive, that's because here you're semiconducting, there's, there's, you're here in the gap, uh, you put in a certain number of electrons, electrons start to flow in the system and the resistance goes down and uh, you should not expect anything much to happen because you're just filling more and more electrons in the semiconductor but hey voila, you see that there's a peak in the resistance so there's, there's a resistive state that all of a sudden appears where there shouldn't be a resistive state. And we've done this for different angles, so here these are different angles 4 and 4.5 and 4.9, and 5.15 and there's, there's sort of a beautiful progression with where these things occur. And to cut a long short story short, in each of these samples, there is a Moray pattern. Moray pattern is defined by uh, this twist angle. And exactly when I have put one electron on each Moray site, that's when I have this insulating state appear. 
So, like twisted bilayer graphene. And once again, like twisted bilayer graphene, I can simply apply a gate voltage and I can tune through a metal to insulator transition. So, if I'm sitting at a density that's away from this half filling point, I measure the resistance as a function of temperature. The thing is a metal, the resistance goes down as a function of temperature. And uh, if I sit exactly at half filling and I come down as a function of temperature, initially the sample is metallic, there's a metal insulator transition around 10 Kelvin and then it starts to go insulating. So, uh, quite nice. But this system actually has some nice tunability beyond what's, what's present in the twisted bilayer graphene. Um, what we can do is we can sandwich this, this twisted bilayer between two electrodes, apply a positive potential to one and a negative potential to the other one. If you do this, you're going to create an electric field uh, that goes from, from one direction to the other. And if you think about what an electric field does to electrons in these two layers, then the electron in one layer is going to feel a different electrostatic potential than the electron in the other layer. And so, if I start initially with two layers, with two valence bands that are degenerate, when I start to apply this electric field, I'm going to displace one of these uh, valence bands relative to the other one. If you ask, in, in theory, what does this do to the electronic structure, this is the initially degenerate valence bands that are hybridized. And then now, as I start to apply this electric field, one of them goes up, the other one goes down, and I break this degeneracy. And this is the resulting density of states. So initially, there is a Van Hove singularity, this peak in the density of states that happens to be somewhere close to, but not exactly half filling. And as I apply an electric field, this Van Hove singularity dies out and it runs away, away from half filling. And uh, I can talk to those who are interested. We can actually confirm this directly with the Hall effect that this picture is true. Now, the really interesting part is that if you measure the resistance of the sample as a function of this electric field, then what you see is that at very low electric field, the sample is a metal. At very high electric field, the sample is a metal. But there is a range of electric field where the sample is an insulator. So simply by applying an electric field, you can drive uh, a metal to insulator to metal transition. So, so quite nice. And you can measure what the size of the gap is in the insulating region by performing activation measurements. And what we find really nicely is that this gap continuously seems to go to zero as you hit the metallic state. And to my mind, this is possibly one of the very few examples where this metal insulator transition could be second order, which would be a continuous transition, which would make it very interesting for all sorts of, of future explorations. OK, so we've seen this behavior across all of these different angles. This is the, that insulating phase. Um, and uh, let me cut this story short, other than to say that these samples also do go superconducting. And uh, when you dope away from the half filling point, there's a little region of superconductivity. And quite interestingly, the TC of this sample is very similar to the TC of twisted bilayer graphene on the order of a few Kelvin, three Kelvin or so. And uh, you think to yourself, you know, the phonons of this material are completely different. Everything is completely different from, from graphene. What is very much the same is that the sizes of the Moray patterns are quite similar to each other. And so perhaps this is some. Uh, hint that electronic mechanisms could be responsible, although that's, that's not a very solid statement at all. Okay, so how am I doing in terms of time? Am I out of time? There's a clock. Okay, but... A few minutes late, so let's yeah. Uh, let, me, let me skip this part. Okay. So let me go over this. I just want to say uh, one last thing, which is what really is going to restrict this field is our ability to actually see these Moray patterns. As somebody mentioned, uh, strain is a bad thing. A anytime you have strain, your beautiful Moray pattern can start to look like this. And so if you, if you don't have a crystal to begin with, then life is bad. 
And one of the key issues is when you make one of these samples, how do you know what it is that you've created without doing something like STM? STM is, is a lot of work. I want to have a sort of very simple way to actually see what the sample is, what that Murray pattern is, um, um, and, 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 and proceed from there. And it turns out that there's actually a very, very simple way to do this. It turns out that all of these Moray materials actually have uh, a piezoelectric response, um, which you can see by applying an AC electric field to a simple AFM and measuring um, the response. And this is, this is quite fascinating in and off of itself. If you take graphene, a sheet of graphene has inversion symmetry, so it has no piezoelectric effect. Uh, but if I take two sheets of graphene, then exactly at the domain walls, I do seem to develop uh, a piezoelectric response. And I don't want to tell you, get into the details of all of this, other than to say that this technique is absolutely fantastic. So any two materials, when we create a Moray pattern, uh, single layer graphene on hexagonal boron nitride, this is twisted WLC2, twisted hexagonal boron nitride, WLC2 on MOS2, down to incredibly short length scales of a few nanometers, all of them have this interesting piezoelectric response. And uh, we now sort of use this as a sort of standard metrology. Each time we make a sample, we can at least see what we have before we actually proceed and make some kind of debugs. <coughs> so uh, if you guys do this, then use this technique. OK, so I really think that I'm out of time. Um, let me stop by saying that uh, in, these, in these kinds of materials, there are new tuning parameters, twists between layers, strain between layers, using two layers with different lattice constants. And all of these can give you sort of a variety of length scales in, in, in and engineer band structure in many, many interesting ways. And perhaps right now we don't really know what the limitations to this are, but I think this is as good a way of, of, of simulating quantum systems as many other ways that, that are popular in the field. I did not talk about optoelectronic properties at all, but many of them have beautiful excitonic properties as well. Uh, and the serious limitation in this field is homogeneity of the lattice fundamentally. In order to get good properties, you need to have a homogeneous lattice, and for the most part, we are not there. Um, and let me finally acknowledge the collaborators. Most of the theory comes from the group of Angel Rubio, uh, who is Max Planck in Hamburg, and also the Flatiron Institute, with some from Cyrus Dreyer at Stony Brook. Uh, Corey is a co-conspirator on the Twisted TMD work, that's his grad student Enmin. Jim Horn, uh, Dan Rhodes is now moving to Wisconsin as a professor, did, grew those materials, and stuff with Basov and also with Xiaoyang Zhu. So finally, thank you for your attention. Yeah. Do you see things like uh, localization, anti-localization, these sorts of things as you approach the uh, metal insider transition on either side? Mm. No, it's pretty clean at low field. We just see nice linear Hall response. Uh, no, no, sorry, I, I just meant in row x-axis. Just assuming you apply that. So, magneto resistance in the longitudinal... Uh, mm. There's not, not anything significant. So what happens at high field is that you can kill this insulating state, which tells you it's non-magnetic, but nothing much at low field in, in rho xx. In rho xy, you can see where the Lifshitz transition is. Yes? So if the, uh, the insulator stays pneumatic, there should be a finite temperature phase transition. We haven't done any temperature dependence to, to, but yes, you're right, yeah. So we can definitely see that there's some transition as a function of doping, but not as a function of temperature so far. Uh, so it seems to be, uh, TC seems to be highest around five degrees. 
So when Cora came here last time, he said that um, the stage is very fragile, like he only saw it in one device, so I'm just wondering like, if there was... Yeah, so now we have three of them. And it is fragile, so if you cycle the device very often, the device will die. Um, in these <coughs> materials, making contact with the samples is a tough job, and it's not clear where exactly the superconducting path is. And so that's very much sort of something that we're still in the process of improving. So, so far it has the highest GC for 5 degrees? Yeah, so five, close to 5. 5 and 4.9 is where we've seen superconductivity, and really at lower angles we have not seen superconducting behavior so far. Yeah. And interestingly, it appears also close, as a function of electric field, you can tune the insulating phase, and close to where the insulating phase is maximized is where we also see superconductivity. Yes. Yeah. Have you tried STM on twisted tungsten? Yes. So. For technical reasons, STM is more complicated for doing this. And we've done STM, but we cannot get to that half filling point before our contacts crack out. And so we can sort of do STM and look at beautiful lattices and measure semiconducting gaps. But when we want to come close to that half filled insulator, the device dies. And so that's so far been a limitation. But we'll get there. We'll get there. Give us another six months. So there is one very recent experiment, I think it's from Feng Wang, uh, looking at twisted bioreographene and doing RPES on it. But ZX has disappeared, so I can say this now, RPES is going to be useless on these things because the energy scales we're talking about are millivolts, right? And there are probably one or two RPES machines which can do this, and they work on sort of big samples. So you have sort of a small sample, and you want energy scales that are a couple of millivolts. So yes, in the Feng Wang paper, it was very nice that they could indeed see the two separate graphene layers, and you can sort of see something connecting the two of them. But to get the level of energy resolution that one can sort of trivially get with STM, in my opinion, given current state of the art, is not going to happen. Uh, oh, Yes, yeah, so in, in, the, in the graphene case, and even in the twisted WSC2, well, so in twisted WSC2, you can see clear lambda levels at high field. Uh, at low field, we are trying to look at the quantum oscillations and look at the temperature dependence to get the effect of masses and so on. Uh, still not quite clear. In the case of graphene, that's been done extensively by Pablo and many other people. Yes. Uh, but, uh, can you still do that with, uh, with uh, encapsulated samples? Yes, so um, we can go through reasonably thin, not very thick. If the boron nitride is very thick, then you cannot image through it. But for a few nanometers of boron nitride, we can actually image through the boron nitride and, and see. Yeah, so we've demonstrated that. All right, well, if there are no further questions, then let's thank you.